Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's presentation, Enterprise Data Warehouse Optimiz Optimization with Hadoop Big Data. Your uh, presenters today are Dave Henry. Uh, Dave Henry is the SVP of uh, Enterprise Solutions at Pentaho, and Dave Ness, the VP of EMEA and APAC. Both Daisy and Dave are experts in big data analytics, so again, please don't hesitate to send in your questions for the Q&A session at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Daisy. Right, thank you, Rob. Uh, and thank you all for joining. We've got quite a crowd out there, uh, very international as well. For the folks that wonder where the, the funny accent comes from, I am based in Belgium, <laughs> and I'm very glad to take you through our data warehouse optimization for uh, for Hadoop Big Data today. Um, first things first, you know, let's, let's dive a little bit into why we all are here and why we all are interested in big data. Uh, there's there's a, a variety of ways of looking at this, and I'm sure you've been confronted with a numerous set of, of these types of input to assets. Um, but I don't know, the bottom line is that I think this phrase probably points the best way and captures the best way data is to the new oil. And, and the good thing about this type of data is that it is a, a piece of oil that is available to large and smaller organizations, especially with the new technologies coming out. Um, but for all of us, it, it presents a great opportunity, um, again, small and large organizations, to, to leverage the availability of all sorts of data streams in all its variety uh, to gain competitive advantage and to, um, you know, to better serve customers. And that is definitely something that we're seeing out there when we're talking with our customers and, and people that come to print out. Um, now, as Rob mentioned, this is the first one in a four-part webinar series that we're going to do around um, big data and, and how can power and just overall the technologies that we can can adopt to, to help you in this area. Now there's there's really two main categories in how people um, you know sort of want to tackle the big data challenge and solution. One is all around uh, data processing and the other is around uh, big data analytics. And just to be clear in today's session we'll fully focus on the data processing side. Um, just to make uh, sure that there, there is that low-hanging fruit that organizations can tackle today, straight away, with the technology that's available um, in the area of uh, data processing or data processing in general. Throughout some of the other sessions that we'll be doing, um, like our fourth session, we'll also look into how you know, analytics comes into play. Because in the end, people want to pretty stuff. Um, they want to have their fancy dashboards, and, and that's also something that you should start looking into. Um, so for today's session, we've got some uh, fairly straightforward goals. We want to talk you through the challenges that, that we see on the current enterprise data warehouse architecture and talk you through some of those. Then see some of the trends and shifts that we uh, definitely experience with our customers and how they've tried to tackle and are still trying to tackle uh, these challenges. Then ultimately how Hadoop can help and then how you can further leverage Hadoop with a Pentaho visual map solution. And we have a pretty unique offering uh, in there that, that can definitely help you to even extend the benefits that you would get from, uh, from data processing to, uh, to Hadoop. Now, as I mentioned, the, the complete analytics and, and data management picture doesn't just stop at data ingestion, manipulation, integration, or the, the whole data processing layer. Um, it potentially doesn't necessarily stop only on Hadoop. There are other parts of this as well. Um, so there are no SQL database, analytical databases. Uh, and then on the sort of the functional side, you may want to ultimately get into enterprise interactive reporting, maybe do data discovery visualization, and ultimately, which a lot of companies uh, you know, are drawn to for big data, um, analytics is predictive analytics and machine learning. Again, I want to emphasize you know, there's a lot of topics out there. And then today, we're only focused on that piece that will um, show you on the, on the data integration side. So how does the sort of the picture look like today? If you look at a traditional data warehouse architecture, you know, predominantly you'll, you'll be processing some structured data. Um, you'll have an extract transform load layer, which is any of um, the ETL tools out there, hopefully Pentaho, but there are obviously others out there as well. 
and you will use that to acquire your source data and then ingest, load that into um, a data mart or a data warehouse after you plan to transform, maybe link it with some other data. Potentially, you're also already processing some unstructured data through this new system. Um, but most, most, in most cases, people still focus on their traditional data flow. Um, what we also see out there is that most of this is done through batch processing overnight, so sort of the, the nightly load, as everyone refers to it. And then you have essentially some escalate with your business to make it available so that ultimately the business can connect on their data warehouse to you know, the metadata layer, semantic layer, that ultimately will drive their dashboard business and analyzers. Um, in the session or the part of the session that Dave will cover, he will go through um, in more detail um, uh, into this architecture, but that's at a high level what, what you probably are doing well, a lot of companies are doing well, out there are doing right now. Now, in terms of the, uh, the challenges, and the trends that we see with this batch data processing approach, there are really two major trends. First, on the data load side. So as you all know, and there's, again, there's a variety of statistics out there, uh, data we're producing you know, up until 20, then uh, we're now producing you know, in a matter of days, and it's expected that we may be producing the same amount of data, data this year in just 10 minutes. So there's just a, an ever-increasing volume of existing data, but also new data sources that just steadily increase and almost exponentially increase the data flow. So obviously, that puts a lot of pressure on some of these load curves. Um, in addition, there's also requirements to make data available for longer periods. Um, so there's the whole data load process giving her an immense amount of pressure, uh, just pure from the data perspective. What ha what's been happening in uh, the past few years is that more and more organizations have been adopting an ELTL approach. That means that they're extracting data from source system. They load it up in raw form into a type of enterprise data warehouse or even the enterprise data warehouse into a staging area, and then transform it through the native data-based technology, typically your SQL statement, creating new tables, and then ultimately load those new tables into the official data warehouse, which is part of that whole infrastructure. We're talking uh, about it as if it are different systems, but often within one system, but sort of a logical separation. That's how people have been trying to deal with this as they, um, as they move on. Now, the effect to that um, is that the enterprise data warehouse uh, can handle with an increasing data and then also the workload in addition to has to cover because now all of a sudden there's, there's additional workloads that are happening through the batch processing. Um, so the effect uh, is that companies must have al sort of alternatives and look at how can we reduce the pressure on the data warehouse. And you know, the obvious one is to use the volume of data, to start you know, leaving out certain data sources and ignore them. Um, that's a simple thing to do. may not be always the most pleasing answer, but sometimes you have to make hard decisions. The other thing is to restrict end-user access. And also that is something that's more and more difficult to, uh, to justify. As we have this whole idea of the knowledge worker uh, in business analytics using the intelligence solutions, but that whole idea and that, that sort of that imaginary border between a knowledge worker and a non-knowledge worker is trying to fade out. So who, who decides and who gets access to information and who will not get access to information? So that's also really difficult. And then the final piece is uh, how do you justify um, additional capacity? Yeah. Sometimes there's been various studies by, by analysts that say, hey, some of these data warehouse systems can, can cost you up to $100,000 per terabyte. So how do you justify um, adding that data, adding that capacity as you try to handle these loads? So in the end, you know, companies face a, a, a limited set of challenges. One of them comes from the compromise itself. Right. You know, reducing data, restricting access, having to invest um, additional money, obviously, is, is a pretty big challenge that you may have to deal with. Um, and the incremental outlay of capital required to expand the data may be another one. Right? There may be no justification 
uh, we've gone through some, some rough economic times, uh, which every decision comes in which prudently or not, this is one of them. And then the other piece is that a lot of uh, organizations have standardized and certain ETL standards through technology. And that, that on its own may be you know, a challenge to further optimize your um, enterprise data warehouse because potentially you may not support some of these newer technologies as effectively as you, you may want to. So what we see as an, a solution to this is a new sort of upcoming architecture. And again, Dave will dive into some variety uh, because it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you pull all your structured data, unstructured data, and flush it through Hadoop. You could either you know, put it alongside your data warehouse or like it's drawn in this uh, map in, in front of your data warehouse. So the whole idea is that you have a secondary storage that is you know, based on commodity hardware that's built very nicely, doesn't cost you $100,000 per terabyte, um, where you can uh, pull in data um, into and then leverage its processing capability to further optimizing some of the data processing and take away some of that load from the data warehouse. So basically that you can keep your database lean and mean. That's the whole idea. And then ultimately, again, you know, the only analytics layer here shown is that people who go through this data mart or the data warehouse, again, there are alternatives to the discussed in our following series where people can actually go directly to the, um, the Hadoop section to analyze um, their data. Now, what that means and what that brings to organizations is it's a core real immediate benefit. First of all, in peak performance. As some of these batch data processing um, loads are under pressure you know, and often you know, struggle to meet the service level agreement they have with the business. Essentially, you have a six hour, eight hour window, if it's that long even, and you're starting to hit against that, that limit, uh, and you, you, you need to make some tough decisions. Secondly, you can also start retaining all the data for any analyst. You have no hard decisions anymore about which data has to go dark. And your marketing department can all of a sudden do longer, uh, longer based analytics uh, across uh, their, their consumers or across the behavior from, from the consumers versus, oh, we only have a, a certain window because at that point we're at a cutoff point and we'll, we'll remove some of that data from the data warehouse. Obviously, that ultimately lowers the cost of data management because there is an alternative that will store data and process data at a lower cost point. Um, so that allows you to better manage your cost, your investment, um, and be ready for growth. And then ultimately, you can also look at extending the existing enterprise data warehouse capacity because as you remove some of the burden, you remove some of the tasks, you actually get a, a, you know, a bigger bang for your buck, so to speak, because the data warehouse can focus on the things it does best versus you know, that dealing with some data flows and some batch um, data processing. So overall, if we talk to our customers or talk to who are still considering um, big data solutions and, and potentially to do, there are really three key areas where they'll look to improve it. First of all, it's the flexibility. Uh, we all know the pressure and the tension between IT and the business and how easy is it to add a data set, to add a certain field, to add a certain dimension. And there's very little flexibility. And obviously, an enterprise data warehouse forces you to be very rigid in your definition. So increased flexibility is something that definitely a lot of organizations are looking for because out there in the business world, not everything is predictable. You need to be very agile in how you want to analyze the situation and then make decisions to, to move your business up. Secondly, it's the timing. So how quickly can we make something available and have it ready for business to, to, to start analyzing information and getting insights? And then most importantly, is the cost. You know, can I justify, if I do all these things and I make all these available, what will that mean to um, my bottom line? What will that mean in terms of, can I really invest $100,000 against this new data source? Is my gains are potentially lower or, or questionable? So how do I uh, how do I justify that? Now, as we see, um, and as people move into uh, Hadoop, there are a few other pitfalls, and, and that's why we're doing this webinar here today, and also want to show you how we can help. Um, when 
people are starting to talk um, about it recently, and it really seems to sort of, um, you know, as much as we would also analyze and investigate them, like, okay, well, what are you facing? What are you struggling with these issues as you want to implement with this? One of the things that comes up pretty often is, okay, you know, we're finding it difficult to find research. People that actually know the technology. Um, the manual coding is a big challenge as well. Right? It actually takes up a lot of time. It takes six to nine months to get the to get something going, um, and that is hard to then justify the implementation. Uh, so, um, as people struggle with implementing a group and getting value out of the group, basically, also that puts pressure on those two key elements for, for which we implement the group in the first place, which is flexibility, time, and, and, and cost savings. Um, and that's really where Pen Power comes into play. So, one of the, what we're going to show you through the demo. And so really how we can interplay and how our platform which which can help you with the preparing and modeling of the data, the data integration layer, uh, uh, through a visual designer um, and, and a very um, easy to use um, designer tool can help you to get those data flows um, up and running very quickly, deploying into the Hadoop cluster. Um, so your data becomes ready for ultimately your business users that want to visualize and store that data. And down the line, maybe even want to do some discovery into this. Uh, as a result, we can sort of get a full continuity from data access to decision. Uh, you have faster development and faster runtime. And then uh, you, you support instant and interactive analytics, which we'll cover later on in some of our other sessions. So, sort of giving you that initial um, overview, I'll now hand it over to Dave, who will talk a little bit more about solution architecture. And also show you a quick demo of uh, how and how can help you. Hey, thanks, thanks, hey, Andy. If you could advance to the next slide for me, please. Yeah, maybe I can do that. I got that. So, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you through a demo because I think you need to see this. Um, it's important, however, to put this in context, right? So, Hadoop is a general-purpose environment, a general-purpose uh, computing environment. It combines storage and compute capability in a highly distributed grid. In fact, I think it's really the first kind of industry standard high performance grid we've seen and there's been huge uptake. But the challenge, particularly if you are new to Hadoop, is where do you get started, right? Davey mentioned that there are, are at least two different categories of use cases, right? There are people that are trying to, to uh, use the batch data processing capability to drive operational efficiency. And there are people who are trying to uh, use the, the scalability of Hadoop to do analytics at scale against large amounts of data. And typically, they're trying to drive um, uh, innovation and advantage. And those involve different objectives, business objectives, different tolerance to risk, require different skill sets. So for example, uh, if you're trying to achieve operational efficiency, you may not need predictive analytics. If you're trying to achieve innovation, you're probably looking at something like predictive analytics, and uh, and that makes it a, a different staffing model depending on what you're trying to do. What we we've, we've been working with um, Hadoop customers and in the ecosystem for, for over three years now, and I would say that four out of five of our customers are really driven uh, initially by operational efficiency, and they're driven by some of the pain points that Davey uh, talked about. So uh, the biggest pain point we see is people meeting their SLAs on their data marts and data warehouses. So data volumes grow, you've got a fixed batch processing window. Uh, as your data volumes grow, it becomes more difficult to meet that existing SLA. And then the business comes along and says, hey, I'd like to you know, either look at more historical data, can you put more data in, in the ETL process, uh, or I'd like to add another data source, and that just compounds the problem. So. Um, Majority customers will will really look to implement Hadoop to optimize their data warehouse. It's not to say that innovation and advantage are not legitimate goals; they are, right? And we're going to talk about that later on in the series. But um, if you're just starting to consider Hadoop, or, or and you feel it has strong promise for your organization, by taking this efficiency approach, you can get Hadoop installed. Uh, you can get it in production. You can uh, show some business value. And you can do that while taking some fairly moderate risks uh, compared to the other use case, which involves more technical risk, more business risk. I'm talking about the analytics. So that's how we're going to focus on data warehouse optimization uh, first. 
Now, this is the context you're going to see. So you've got a, a data warehouse up here. It's, you know, as Davey described, fairly traditional. It could be an operational data store and data marts. It could be a single data warehouse. It could be uh, an enterprise data warehouse. It doesn't really matter that much, right, to us. But what we're going to do is we're going to put in a Hadoop cluster, and we're going to bring in uh, data. Now, that may be uh, high volumes of data, a new types of data sources, so CDR being called detail records, the web log data, could be digital device data. Uh, it could even be some of these sources of data. It could be data off of a mainframe, for example. It needs to be data that fits well into Hadoop. So Hadoop's optimized for very large data sets, not real small data sets. But anything that fits that criteria of very large data sets is a good candidate to be raw data and to come in here. We get the raw data in, and we typically go through uh, a parsing, validation, and enrichment phase. And that's typically done at the lowest grain of the data, so at a fine, fine level of detail on individual records. And Hadoop is a phenomenal engine for doing that. It has the ability to scale horizontally and to process raw data in parallel and to get that data um, prepared for further use, right? In addition, we'll often combine this raw data with master data, right? To make sense of data, we may need to take some of our master data out of the data warehouse, our lookup data, uh, our reference data, and uh, put it into Hadoop so we can blend that data together. And when we do that, what we find is that data is then ready to be consumed. It's basically an analytic data set. Now, we may still need to go through some standard data warehouse processes, you know, for things like uh, dimension lookups and slowly changing dimensions. We probably would continue to do that outside of the data warehouse. But the whole point is that we can offload a tremendous amount of processes. So if you're using SQL or maybe, you know, store procedures, BL SQL, things like that, you can take much of that logic and you can implement it inside of Hadoop. Now, of course, the challenge is how do you do that without writing Java code or writing scripting code? Of course, that's where Compaho comes in. So that's what we're going to focus on is, is using Hadoop as an adjunct to data warehouse. I want to point out, because um, I think it's, it's significant, that, you know, data integration is part of Compaho. So our complete solution is data integration plus analytics. We think there's some pretty compelling reasons to consider Pentaho for analytics um, as well as data integration. Uh, but if you have existing uh, analytics products and you want to use just Pentaho's data integration, you can do that, right? And when we focus on data integration, we're really talking about everything from the, uh, the ingestion phase of structured data and really semi-structured data through the processing. I'm going to talk about this visual MapReduce concept. Uh, and then orchestration. So it's not enough just to have the process. You need to be able to string this together and, and make it work as part of a, a larger whole. We'll, we'll give you an example of that in the demo. The other thing I want to point out is that you know, we're not talking about replacing the tools that you may already be using in Hadoop. So if you have PIG, if you have Hive, you're using uh, streaming uh, Hadoop jobs uh, with Python, you've got Uzi, Scoop, et cetera, um, we've embraced those, those tools as well. So it's a, it's a yes plus answer to, to the problem. So you have the ability to use Compaho's uh, capabilities as well as to use Compaho to execute SIG scripts that you might, might already have or Java map that you might already have. So we're not asking you to rewrite, we're asking you to consider using Compaho as, a, as an adjunct going forward. So let's take a look at, at an example. This is really the subject for the, the demo. So oftentimes we get requests. You guys get requests all the time from the business analysts. And, and, and sometimes the questions are real simple. Like if we're trying to understand uh, by geography the top 10 states for outbound call volumes on a, on a weekend, um, that's a very simple business question. We just need to understand um, the state where the, the call originated from and the, uh, the day. You know, so we just need a, uh, a date and the outbound phone number. The challenge really comes from the fact that this can be at scale. So if you're going to process this using a single-threaded process running outside of Hadoop, it's probably going to take a long time. If you're going to use your database to do this, it's going to consume resources in your database to, to ingest that raw data and format it. So really what our goal is, is just, let's just see if we can do that in Hadoop. So let's parse and rich and filter the data uh, using Pentaho and using Hadoop. And then let's, let's load that data into Postgres. 
right? And again, the challenge here is to do all this without impacting the EDW. So, you know, in addition to um, improving your SLAs on your ETL, one of the things to consider is that by offloading that enterprise data warehouse, you're going to make it more available for query. And I, and I know that David, David talked about that. I just want to reinforce that. What this, what this looks like, um, it, it's relatively simple. In fact, um, Hadoop data processing doesn't need to be complex to be valuable. You may have multiple files, um, and those files can be automatically aggregated by Hadoop so that they look to your ETL process in Hadoop like a single uh, stream of data. You may have multiple streams of data. You may have multiple work streams that you need to code. But oftentimes the challenges come from just working at scale. Now we've got uh, more involved examples that we can give you, uh, maybe in a follow-up call, and take you through some more in-depth processing examples. But this is going to be a, a, a fairly simple one. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that raw data, get it into Hadoop, and then we're going to extract the piece of information we need so our match here involves doing a match on an area code, right? You'll notice we can't join based on the phone number with the area code. We have to, we have to do essentially a cut or an abstraction, a substring type function, which means it's hard to do that in SQL with something like, like Hive. And you can use those tools to do it. That's more suited for, for an ETL tool. And then what the implementation just kind of looks like at a high level is this concept of visual MapReduce. So the first thing you need to understand is the architecture. The architecture of Compaho is that it's a pipeline data flow architecture using components. So data flows into this pipe. Uh, a component uh, gets that uh, a buffer of data, and then it starts performing some kind of specialized operation on it. So, for example, maybe the the first buffer of data comes in and it goes to a calculator step, and that calculator step looks at the date and it breaks it apart to the month, the day, the day of the week. And then it fills its output buffer and it passes it on to another component. And that component will get that three-digit area code. And then passes it to another component where we'll do a lookup against our master data, which is stored in the Hadoop file system, and we do some enrichment. And so forth and so on. We do filtering, et cetera, et cetera. The idea is that this is a, a pipeline, it's a data flow, and all we really have to be concerned about as an ETL developer is what's at the head of the flow and what's at the tail or the bottom of the flow. And what's at the head of the flow is what we call MapReduce input and similarly a MapReduce output at the end. And these are key value pairs. So the one thing to get your head around, and maybe some of you are using uh, Compile Data Integration today or Cattle, and you're, you're familiar with this, the only thing that you need to understand as an ETL developer if you're using Compile is, you know, how is data stored in Hadoop? How am I getting it into the MapReduce framework? And then what does my value string look like, right? Uh, because I'm going to get that value string, break it apart, I'm going to parse it, and then I'm going to run it through all of this, these, these steps. It's really that simple, right? So there's no coding here. That's the other thing I'd point out. This is not a um, code generator architecture. It's a runtime. So this is all pure Java. All these components are written in Java. And at runtime, what we'll do is we will uh, give our Java data flow pipeline engine uh, over to Hadoop and say, hey, we're, we're a Hadoop job. We want you to run this. And what will happen is that Hadoop will say, great, we know how to run MapReduce. Do you have any dependent uh, library files? We'll say, yeah, here's our library files. And we'll say, got it, right? And so Hadoop will put that into the distributed cache. And then at runtime, as we start executing this across multiple nodes, because this is managed code or code managed by Hadoop, Hadoop will take care of making sure that all the nodes that are going to execute this pipeline have access to all the Pentaho files. That also allows us to be very portable. We have the ability to run on multiple distribution. So we support uh, Cloudera, obviously Apache, Hadoop, Hortonworks, MapR, Intel, and others that uh, that we'll be announcing. So by, by virtue of the fact that we're not generating code and that we're pure Java-based and we're staying very close to the Apache Foundation definition for MapReduce means that we're very portable. So just, that's just some comments on the architecture. I think what, um, what I'll do here to kind of help this make more sense, let me go ahead and 
and share my uh, uh, VMware image. We'll bring that up here, and hopefully you guys can, can see that. Looks like it's sharing now. Um, this is, I'm going to show you these three different tabs. So I've got three tabs on the top here for running inside of Contaho uh, Data Integration. Which this, for those of you who've used Contaho in the past, this is the Spoon Designer. So what I have over here on the left is a, uh, basically a, a palette of components, right? So you can see I've got input components, I've got output components, transformation components, the warehouse related steps and so forth. This is your toolkit if you're a developer, right? And so what you do is you use this toolkit, these individual components, to build out that flow. Now, because we have limited time today, I built this out in, in advance. But you'll notice that this transformation looks very similar to what I showed you in PowerPoint. So we have the MapReduce step, right? And if we take a look at that, we can see that what's going to come in is a key value field. So we've got a key value pair. And that key value pair is going to flow through this pipeline. So we're going to break it, break it apart into a date and a source number based on a comma delimiter. Then we'll use our calculator to go out and uh, perform date-based calculations. So, and you know, you could write this in a scripting language, but what we're doing is we're giving you a whole series of, say, date-based uh, date processing that you can do. Uh, string-based manipulation, obviously column-based math, and so forth. Um, we move on to another specialty component that gets that three-digit area code out of the source number. So again, this is more taking components and setting properties than it is writing software, writing code, um, and so forth, all the way down through a lookup step. So we store our geographic data uh, here in the Hadoop file system, and then we have a lookup step that allows us to uh, basically match on the area code and pull in three fields that are our master data for our area for our geography dimension, the state, country, and time zone. I think you're starting to get the feel for this. Hopefully, it gets down even to components that do things like uh, like filtering, for example, right? So we don't want to um, filter after we run the Hadoop job. We want to filter as part of the Hadoop job. So we want to basically throw away records where the country's not uh, the United States or where the, the, the day that the call was made uh, was not either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So again, you know, you can build this in else logic or you can use these kind of components. So this uh, comes in as a key value pair. We execute all this logic. And then at the end, we package it up as a key value pair. And basically, we're just taking that record structure that we're working with inside of the mapper in this case, we're just deciding which of the columns are going to be our key and our value field, right, and passing that on out. So you can put anything you want in here, any of these components, right? In addition, you can, if, you're, if you have your own Java code, it's, it's straightforward to take your own Java code, plain, plain Java code, and drop it in here. Your Java code doesn't need to know anything about MapReduce or the framework. We take care of that through this interface up here in there. So that's kind of an overview. The, the next thing I'll say is we said the goal was to load it into a database. So I'll show you this tab here. This is a much simpler transformation. We'll tie this together in a job here in a second. But once I run my MapReduce job, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that file from Hadoop. So I'm going to pull it out of Hadoop. This is, a, this is an instance where we're pulling instead of pushing. We have, we have options to push from outside of Hadoop as well. We're going to pull the data out of the Hadoop file system, and we're going to load it into a Postgres database. So you see here that I have Postgres connection defined. I have a target table. And if I click on edit here, you'll see that I have a, a broad variety of database types that, uh, that are supported, including all the ones you'd expect to see, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, MySQL, as well as things like Vertica, Green Plum, Matiza, and so forth. So that is, uh, that is basically the transformation line. So let's take a look now at the orchestration. So we, we looked at the transformation. This is our MapReduce code. This is our post-MapReduce code where we're going to load the database. 
and then we just have a job to tie it all together. So a transformation manipulates data. What a job does is a job sequences events. So we have a start, and we have one of two end conditions. Either we're successful, or we've encountered some error, and we're going to abort. So the first thing I want to do is, uh, you know, copy all this data into Hadoop. We have job steps that let you take source directories and copy data into uh, Hadoop. Um, by the way, that's not the only way to get data in Hadoop, so we can also show you how you could do that with Bloom, for example. Uh, we have customers that have written uh, Java components, which they run and set up in Tahoe because they have custom handlers for doing data ingestion. So we've got some very some flexibility here. In our case, we're copying the data in ourselves. Then we have a transformation at the end, right, which we're going to execute, which is this transformation here to do the load. And then in the middle here, we have the interface to Hadoop. So let's take a look at that, because that's what we care about the most. So anywhere you have a mapper, combiner, or reducer function, you can have a Pentaho transformation, one of those transformations that have a MapReduce input and MapReduce output. In this particular case, we're just processing the data straight through. We're not doing any aggregation. So we're only using uh, is a mapper. But if you wanted to do a roll-up, and then load aggregated data into your data warehouse, so it was optimized and you didn't want to do the aggregation in your data warehouse, you could create a reducer function and you could use Hadoop to do your, your kind of first order aggregation as well. That was pretty common. Um, so we have a transformation. The job setup is pretty straightforward. We have an input directory and an output directory, which is required for any Hadoop job. Uh, and then we just have information about the cluster. So we've got where are we uh, connecting, uh, for the name node, where are we connecting for the job tracker? And then you also have the ability to do some tuning with this if you want. But we've decided to keep this as, as simple as possible. We do have other components that you could use here. We have a pitch strip component, for example, or a Java MapReduce component. So there are other things that you can do. This is an example of, of doing it with Pentaho. So let's go ahead and, and run this and just see how it works. So as this starts to run, you'll see that uh, as a step completes, it gets a green check mark along the side of it, right? And, and then it passes over control. So right now, we can see that control has been passed over to Hadoop. And um, we did a couple things, right? So after we copied our data, we cleaned the output path here. Uh, then we configured Pentaho job. So we, we did that inquiry about, hey, is the runtime configured correctly? And then we launch the job. And you can see here that it goes through a setup phase, it goes through a mapper phase, and it goes through a reducer phase. And it's literally executing. In fact, if I'm quick enough, um, I may be able to catch it, yeah, catch it running over here in the MapReduce administration uh, screen. So if you've got tools for monitoring this stuff, we're just a normal Hadoop job. So we're going to show up in any of those tools we're going to be subject to any of the quotas that you might have put in place and so forth. So now you can see that uh, it finished the MapReduce job, and then it uh, executed that Postgres uh, load. So step by step, popping the files in, giving control over to Hadoop, taking control back, pulling the data out of Hadoop, loading it into Postgres. So that is, you know, to summarize, what we've done is we took a complete use case, right, which involved you know, getting data into Hadoop, uh, not just raw data, but reference data, doing that, that uh, parsing, uh, the validation, and the enrichment, uh, doing the filtering, and then uh, packaging that back up, producing the output, allowing Hadoop to produce the output, and then making it ready. Now it's sitting in a database where an analyst can take advantage of it. Now you don't have to do um, load it into Postgres, right? We have other options we'll explore later on where maybe you want to create an ad hoc visualization session immediately. You don't want to load it into Postgres. We have a product called InstaView that lets you do that. So maybe hopefully that gives folks a, uh, an idea of, um, of how, this, uh, how this works and um, uh, gives them some sense of how you can optimize an enterprise data warehouse. I'll turn it back yep. over to you. Thank you, Dave. And uh, I'll wrap this up um, so that we, uh, we will be finishing it in the next couple of minutes. Sort of to conclude that, um, in, in 
share with you how we sort of leverage the group with uh, with them. Oh, I think the key concept uh, that we really want you to take away from this is that there's no coding. Um, and no coding has significant impact on a couple of other elements. First of all, it obviously makes it a lot easier and faster to develop. So we've done a, a few head-to-head -head POCs at large uh, organizations where on the one hand, somebody was uh, coding and scripting and we were designing ETL flows pretty darn cool and we, we ended up being 15 times uh, quicker to develop. In addition, it's a lot easier to find resources and you may not even have to go out and find them. You can even uh, train your people um, on, on uh, Pentile and get them going fairly quickly. That was is a big advantage as well. And then ultimately, because we are uh, not Java and ultimately uh, create and generate a, a native uh, Java MapReduce uh, process that we can give to the cluster, we end up uh, executing a lot faster as well. Uh, other benefit that we have uh, is that you can leverage your existing infrastructure. Uh, if you have already have invested heavily in some scripting and uh, coding, you can orchestrate that using Pentaro. Um, and then um, our attractive um, annual subscription licensing model also uh, puts us at a much lower cost point than uh, some of the proprietary vendors out there. Um, now, moving on into some of the, the bigger benefits overall, and what we think you should really consider is, first of all, because we get this question a lot, do not throw away your enterprise data warehouse. Uh, so I'll repeat that again. Do not throw away your enterprise data warehouse. It is not bad. It is still a very good piece of technology that is very useful, especially uh, later on if you start doing some analytics and want to you know, get on one page around key metrics for your organization. But obviously, you can leverage and use Hadoop and Pentile to optimize data processing and keep your enterprise data warehouse clean and neat. From a business perspective, it will allow you to defer some of the investments you need to make on expensive upgrades. You can offload some of the batch processing so that the service level agreements you may have with the business actually can be maintained as data grows and the use cases expand. Um, and even uh, from a cluster perspective, you may do some optimization there for well as your execution moves quicker. On the technical side, we're all exploring how certain new technologies can help us further, how we can leverage them to gain advantage. Well, this is one of those low-risk use cases. You can get going fairly quickly, and you, at the same time, create business value. This is not something where you have to uh, convince uh, your CIO or your business folks, you know, what, what machine learning and customer profiling will help you down the line in 12 months. This is something you can implement today and start reaping benefits from fairly quickly. And it's also easy to start with. You can easily evaluate uh, you don't need to modify either your existing infrastructure, whether you already have a cluster or you want to stand one up. There's no immediate impact on enterprise data warehouse from a, from a configuration perspective. Now, um, we're about um, to close the call and close the webinar. Um, before we do that, um, for the folks that want to stay on a little longer, I realize we are going a little bit longer today as we start a little late, but there is still a Q&A. Uh, so stay on if, uh, if you want to keep address some of the questions. Now, uh, just as a reminder and two quick uh, calls to action. First of all, if you, if you like and what you hear today and you want to know more, in our, uh, definitely sign up for the remainder of our session, especially in the next session we'll team up with Dell and Paul Brook from Dell will talk about uh, some of the initiatives and the solutions they have for standing up a cluster. Uh, they have a very um, interesting open source piece of technology called Crowbar that can help you to go from a um, uh, bare bones, no metal machine into a, a fully working cluster. And then we'll talk about how then you can easily sort of um, stand up and how next to it that you can leverage the cluster. Um, alternatively, if you have some specific questions that you may not want to discuss on this forum, you know, just go out and contact us through the website at pentaro.com um, or reach out to your uh, your local rep. In terms of the questions, um, Dave, one of the questions that I saw in the, the Q&A panel that you may help me address was, um, could you please clarify um, how you uh, describe which part is, uh, is the mapper and which part is the reducer in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in data integration? Yeah, so, um, 
So the mapper and reducer and also the combiner functions are really core concepts within Hadoop's MapReduce, right? And a transformation um, within Pentaho can be used in any of those three modes. But you do want to think about what, what are you doing where, right? So the typical role for a mapper is to deal with all of the input data. Anything that you might need to do to all of the input data in terms of parsing or filtering like we did in our example, um, that would be that logic you would likely implement in, um, in a mapper. Now mappers also just get um, each individual node gets a subset of data to work on. So you need to consider that as well. That uh, that's how you get the parallelism. The reducer is typically used to um, create some kind of summary information about uh, about all records in a set that have a common key, right? And typically that's used for um, producing roll-ups, right? That's the most common common thing that we see. Okay, and then another one I've seen was. Um, this can only work if, uh, if the entire server can uh, keep all the data into memory and load all the data into memory. That's yeah, one, of, what, one of the common uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit on that because I obviously think that's not an accurate statement. Yeah, good good question. So, so again, the way that um, that this works architecturally is when we execute the Pentaho MapReduce job step, we're giving control over to the cluster. And we're not reading any data into the Pentaho server's memory at all at that point. So Hadoop starts up the, the tasks, and those tasks um, obviously are passing data into the Pentaho runtime, and uh, the data flows through that data pipeline, and so the data needs to fit in the local heap, the local Java heap, at, at the individual task node. So um, but since the data is partitioned, it doesn't, all that data does not have to fit into one Java virtual machine. It is, it is spread across n numbers of nodes. Mm -hmm. And then another question I saw was, are there any limitations on the types of uh, data formats that uh, can be uh, included with it? Yeah, good question. So there are, um, we've, um, we've learned a lot in the last year or two working with customers on data formats. Generally, Hadoop does a really good job of, um, of decoding different formats. In fact, MapReduce is really good at um, allowing people to have specialized uh, codecs to bring in different formats of data. So we have the ability to work with um, you know, Avro data, for example, uh, data in JSON format, data coming in from HBase. Um, and it's, it's really a combination of what MapReduce does for us in terms of um, bringing that data from its source into the MapReduce framework and then just the native encoding structure that we see when it comes into that key value pair. But we've made some really good progress on that, and I, I, I think we're addressing all the all the relevant scenarios at this point. Obviously, if you had binary data, you'd need to have your own decoder or format for that. All right. And then I'll, one I'll take, and then uh, one last one for you guys. So here's one. Um, what is the best way to get started with Hadoop? Um, so definitely, again, I would I would recommend you to join next week's session. We'll dive into some of that, uh, specifically how can you get a cluster installed and up and running, um, and then you know install some of the uh, auxiliary technologies around that. Um, I would also recommend you to download any of the Hadoop distributions, and most of them can uh, can easily be downloaded from the respective companies. Uh, the same with Pentaho. Usually go to pentaho.com, download our technology. That can help you to get a cluster going and install uh, Pentaho again alongside on one of the virtual machines and servers that you may have available. Um, next step, probably decide which data process or type of data you want to tackle. Do you want to have some data that you can throw at it? Um, and then if you need some help, there are, there are two stops you can make. One is at pentaobigdata.com. There are a whole bunch of additional resources. There's also a whole bunch of templates that we've been um, sharing with everybody the past few weeks that you can download and easily um, leverage to get going quickly. And then alternatively, um, we as a, as a company can also help you to prototype with your data. So I would say reach out to your local Pentaho team um, and we're more than willing to help you uh, stand up your cluster and, uh, and, and help you with your use case. Um, Dave, then one other for you. So how is the integration of Pentaho to other 
data case that is uh, NoSQL, like a MongoDB. No, really good question, and I know that um, in session three we're going to talk about that specifically, and I'm sure we'll we'll, we'll demonstrate that. So, uh, again, the nice thing about um, the architecture of, of, of compiled data integration being being Java, and the fact that we decouple the pipeline from the source and target, is that uh, we can write interesting input steps. And we've done that for MongoDB, for Cassandra. Uh, for HBase, I, I think there's one for Couchbase as well. And what that allows you to do is to, using the native APIs for those NoSQL databases, all that data. Now then what you need to do is essentially denormalize it uh, uh, and get it into a, uh, a tabular format so you can use it in the tool. Let me provide you with ways of, of doing that. And, and we're making a lot of investment in that area because we see people combining NoSQL data with other, other data sources that are relational. So I'm sure that's going to come up in, uh, in session number three. But great question. All right. Thanks, and I'll, uh, I'll we'll leave it at this. We're 10 minutes past the, uh, the plan end time. Thank yeah. you all for joining us today on this first part of our uh, four uh, webinar series on uh, Empowered Big Data Integration. I hope we can welcome you to the next session. And uh, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.